It's really exciting to be here. Uh, thanks, Paula, for that great introduction. Um, and uh, what I want to do tonight is um, describe uh, some of the work that we've been doing for the past uh, several years um, that represent a range of projects and approaches um, to an intersection of biology, uh, design, and computation. Um, and I should say that um, we've worked directly with synthetic biology and synthetic biologists, um, but just as, as Paula showed, um, we also see this as part of a kind of broader spectrum of design and, and biology and other tools. Um, so some of the things that I'll describe uh, in these projects are not directly using synthetic biology, but I think there's some really interesting um, links. Um, so I'm going to describe uh, these three approaches and, and three uh, projects. Um, and just to kind of give you a sense of what I'm talking about, um, first, biocomputation. This basically, to me, means uh, designing living organisms to compute solutions to human problems. Biosensing. This basically means designing living organisms uh, to monitor their environment uh, and trigger dynamic responses uh, to conditions in the environment. And third, biofabrication. This means designing living organisms to manufacture objects and potentially uh, building materials. Uh, first, uh, biocomputation. So this is designing living organisms to be able to compute solutions, thinking of living organisms as computers in a way. Um, and this project is a collaboration with synthetic biologist Fernand Federici. It started um, through the, the program Synthetic Aesthetics that uh, Paula introduced and that was initiated by uh, Alistair and Jane and Daisy and, and Drew Endy, who's not here. Um, and, and this project um, uh, involved thinking about uh, these incredible systems of growth um, in xylem cells, shown here. Um, but to start, I should say that part of the discussion and the premise here is that biology of today is very different than biology of 100 years ago. Um, of course, uh, biologists um, uh, have fascinated designers and architects for many years, um, but the idea here is that um, something has changed, that uh, conditions are very different today. Uh, we're now able to do um, some amazing things, um, some of them Paula described, um, but we're able to grow cells on uh, tiny plastic chips, grow cells, and subject them to a variety of different chemicals and monitor their responses. Uh, we're able to um, watch the growth of organisms like this, a slime mold, and then use uh, the way that slime mold computes a network to apply to networks at a different scale, such as highways or railroads. We're able to uh, monitor the way that things like embryos grow. These are tadpole embryos uh, recorded by a collaborator of mine, Ali Brivenloo, at Rockefeller University. Um, we're able to uh, monitor the neural pathways, the brain system working in a living tadpole. You can see its heart beating there um, through technologies such as quantum dots. So this is all new stuff that didn't exist when Darcy Thompson wrote his book and closely observed biology 100 years ago. And finally, these are um, stem cells communicating and deciding whether to grow into heart or bone or skin. Um, Perhaps most important for me is that we're able to observe systems like this, the incredibly complex form, three-dimensional form, of bacterial colonies growing. These things grow in the size of about a quarter. Um, and we're able to apply some of the latest computation techniques, com techniques of computer science, to start understanding what's going on in these very complex systems that have developed and evolved over hundreds of years thousands of years, potentially more. Um, so this uh, gives me an in as a designer, because if we're able to use machine learning and computer vision and data visualization to understand uh, these complex systems, um, put them in the computer, then maybe we can use them as design tools. So here's one of the things that Fernan and I did. Um, this is uh, a very expensive microscope that can take um, microscope images at one micron uh, intervals. Uh, you can combine them back together in, uh, in a way like uh, we do with MRIs to create a three-dimensional model. And once we have a three-dimensional model, then it becomes uh, the, the, the kind of palette um, that we traditionally use as designers. Um, so one thing we've started to do is try to take some of these uh, xylem cells 
um, generate a bunch of data about what makes the xylem cell the way it is, um, create a spreadsheet basically of bar length, bar thickness, bar angles, and then feed this spreadsheet into an incredible uh, customized academic computer program called Formulize, developed at Cornell, which will allow you to feed in any data set, like any Excel spreadsheet, and derive a formula that explains the data. Um, of course, this is low resolution. Um, of course, there are some uh, issues with this, but the potential here is that we can then use the algorithm from biology to regenerate um, a xylem cell, but we can also generate xylem cells that never existed in nature. We can create what a xylem cell might do if it had to follow an L shape rather than a straight linear shape. Um, so what do we do with this? Well, one project that we did um, as a kind of continuation of this line of thought was imagine how this could change the way that we design things. Um, and what I'm showing here is a kind of a, a, a stand-in for typical design. We might typically design things, and we still do this today, and it's very powerful, by making a kind of sketch figure of something like a chair. Um, but what if in this new mode of design, we could design some things that we know, like the seat of a chair, but make uh, a, a kind of sketch of the potential design space of some other things that we want to explore, like the legs of a chair. So that's the dashed red line, of course. And this allows us um, to apply something like uh, a xylem cell algorithm, the exoskeleton of a xylem cell, to the legs of a chair and explore many, many possible ways that material might be arranged underneath the seat of a chair to make legs. Um, so we're using a, a loose uh, algorithm derived from biology, what, what we sometimes call a biological algorithm, uh, combined with some techniques, traditional techniques of computation and engineering, such as digitally simulating the structural performance of a chair. Um, such as generating a lot of different versions of a chair, using a computer for what it's very good at, automating certain processes, then using some data visualization techniques to try to sort all of these data points. Each data point is a possible chair design. And then filtering through and applying something that we know how to do very well as humans, which is uh, apply judgment, uh, uh, of apply a layer of... Um, aesthetics, uh, apply a layer of judgment about trade-offs between competing objectives. And in the end, uh, what's interesting to me is that we can combine this with constraints for manufacturing. So we can actually make these objects. Um, and this is a kind of placeholder for what I think has a huge potential, which is a way that we can um, start with model one, that's traditional manufacturing. You make a chair out of solid materials uh, that we can easily put together today. Um, model 2 represents an increase in performance uh, if we're able to use 3D printing, and instead of making solid bars, we make these tiny lattices that you're able to 3D print, but you could never make in any other way. Um, but model 3 is the most interesting to me. We can combine this with uh, you know, what I'm calling biological algorithms to explore entirely new designs for a chair that are beyond our uh, kind of typical human linear way of thinking and our assumptions and our blind spots. We can discover new designs uh, through this technique. Okay, number two, biosensing. Um, this is basically the way that we could use uh, living organisms um, to um, uh, detect things in their environment and respond uh, adaptively. Uh, for several years, we've been exploring um, public interfaces uh, to information in the city, and often these have involved technologies like the Internet of Things, embedding sensors in the environment and uh, making displays of those sensors. Um, but we're, recently we've been adding a biological layer uh, to, to this technique. Um, and this starts uh, by this uh, amazing feature of biology, which is that muscles, living muscles, like shown here, um, open and close their shells at a rate um, that is a very sensitive and sophisticated detector of pollution in the water. So you see all these muscles kind of pulsing here. That's because they're opening and closing. Um, and uh, instead of using some of our sophisticated uh, digital sensors, like a dissolved oxygen sensor, it turns out that you can take living muscles that we're, we're showing here and experimenting with. You can glue a $2 Hall effect sensor to one side of the shell of a muscle, glue an inexpensive magnet to the other side, 
and then detect how much the muscle is opening and closing its shell. And you basically get um, a kind of hybrid uh, biological digital way of detecting information uh, about the environment. And we like to say this is, you know, combining the age-old, uh, you know, target of artificial intelligence with something that seems equally powerful, if not more powerful, a kind of natural intelligence, a biological intelligence that has evolved uh, over millions of years. Um, and what do we do with it? Well, we've been experimenting with doing things like this, which is creating this public interface to water quality in the city, where lights change color according to uh, water quality levels below and give us a, a kind of layer of information in the city, a kind of dialogue with other lights in the city and suggest that our cities can kind of come alive in this new way to tell us uh, about things like environmental health. Uh, three, biofabrication. This is the, the project that Paolo was mentioning, um, and it's, it's, of course, a project um, that in many ways is tied to other similar projects that are using um, this living organism we're using here called mycelium, and also to, to age-old um, projects of using uh, living organisms to help make stuff, to manufacture uh, stuff that's useful for us as humans. What does it really mean to be the best? To us? That, that wasn't my video. <laughs> that's weird. Was it not an eyewitness? No, it wasn't. It's a ghost. But this is mine. There must have been some other YouTube video playing on the computer. So this is our project called Hi-Fi that, of course, was part of uh, the Young Architects program put on by the Museum of Modern Art uh, and MoMA PS1 every summer, a really unique uh, uh, project um, uh, Sorry, um, that gives a young architecture uh, firm an opportunity to explore a new idea about architecture and, and put it in a very public context. Uh, our project was basically an experiment in a new uh, possible paradigm for design and manufacturing with almost no waste, almost no uh, energy required, and almost no uh, carbon emissions. In a way, it was a project that was designed to disappear, to go away, as much as it was a project uh, designed to appear. Um, and how do we do this? Well, uh, of course, through uh, mushrooms or mycelium, as, as Paolo mentioned. Uh, this is a microscope video of the branching uh, filamentous growth of mycelium uh, seen uh, uh, at a very small scale. Um, and when you scale that up, what you can do is take um, something like this, agricultural waste, 
uh, not the high value part of, uh, of agriculture, not the corn kernels, so we're not talking uh, food versus fuel here. It's the waste of, of, of agriculture. Um, you put that together with live mycelium in about five days. You see a time lapse of it here. It grows into a solid object uh, with uh, no energy required. It can even happen in the dark. Um, and basically, this allows us um, to get um, solid objects that are useful to humans that have been grown by uh, a living biological organism. Uh, we did this uh, project and collaborated very closely with Ecovative, the great startup that Paula mentioned, um, and designed bricks. Uh, this is a new um, type of lightweight, low-cost, compostable brick uh, made from mycelium and agricultural waste. Um, we tested this out uh, in the courtyard of MoMA PS1 um, and basically uh, explored a, a new version um, of architecture in the context of the glass and steel buildings of Manhattan, which you can see in the background, and uh, in, in more of the foreground, the, the clay brick uh, uh, buildings of Queens. Um, we created 10,000 of these bricks. Um, and assembled them into a 41-foot tall uh, structure that experimented both with technical performance, you know, the way that we could engineer a strong enough brick that was weather resistant enough to put outdoors, um, but we also experimented with kind of atmospheric qualities or the creative capacity of this material, the way it would play with light and shadow, the way it would create texture and pattern the way it would feel to be in an enclosed environment of this stuff. And those two things are equally important for me as a designer working in this somewhat technical realm. Um, but how can we use this uh, material creatively? And of course, how can it be tested out uh, by things like uh, the weekly parties uh, at MoMA PS1, where 5,000 people come each Saturday to um, see some of the best experimental electronic music uh, in the world. So testing this idea about architecture, testing this thing that starts kind of in the lab, um, but testing it out in the world, in the public, in the elements, um, and seeing if we can create this kind of healthy, healthier uh, ecosystem um, using the Earth's natural healthy carbon cycle, using a living organism of, my, um, of mycelium, um, and going from crops to construction to compost, and then back to crops again in a healthy cycle. Thank you.